Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's 60-minute presentation as part of the webinar series of Wednesday Rainmaking by Women Rainmakers of the American Bar Association Law Practice Division. Our moderator today is Carol M. Bass. Carol joins us today from New York City, where she is a partner in the Trust and Estates Practice Group at Moses Ann Singer. In addition to her involvement with the Women Rainmakers Committee, Carol is an active member of the ABA Real Property Trust and Estate Law Section and serves as vice chair of its CLE standing committee and as co-chair of its non-tax issues group. She is also a fellow of the American College of Trust and Estate Council. Thank you all for joining us. We'll now begin the webinar. Thank you, Sasha. And we thank all the rainmakers around the country who have chosen to learn more about successfully marketing to and serving clients across generations. The mission of the ABA Women Rainmakers is to educate professional women about marketing and business development, to provide mentoring opportunities for members, and to provide networking opportunities to build personal and professional relationships. You can find up-to-date information regarding our initiatives and programming by visiting the ABA Women Rainmakers homepage. Mark your calendars, our 2020 Wednesday Rainmaking webinars will take place on March 18th, June 17th, September 16th, and December 9th. Our March 18th webinar will feature women in technology. Today, we are fortunate to have two wonderful speakers to provide insight on successfully marketing to and serving clients across generations. Today's speakers are Phyllis Weiss Hassero and Whitney Brooks. Phillips Phil, sorry, Phyllis Weiss Hasero is the foremost workplace multi-generational expert speaking with a cross-generational voice. A uniter, she brings the power of cross-generational conversation and collaboration to solve the urgent problems and nuances of attracting and retaining clients and employees of different generations, achieving effective multi-generational teams, knowledge transfer, and succession planning. Phyllis works with organization leadership and multi-generational teams focused on both external and internal stakeholder relationships. She leads cross-generational conversation day workshops, forums, and masterminds for professionals, knowledge workers, and university student and alumni communities. Her newest book on generational challenges is You Can't Google It, The Compelling Case for Cross-Generational Conversation at Work. Phyllis is president of Practice Development Council, a business development and organizational effectiveness consultancy, and a frequent speaker and blogger on intergenerational relations issues for Forbes.com, Next Avenue, Legal Executive Institute, Iris.xyz, LinkedIn, and others. Best-selling author of The Rainmaking Machine, a forthcoming book for ABA law practice titled Gen Engagement, and countless articles for the legal media, she is an insightful and popular podcast guest. Whitney Brooks is a corporate vice president in New York Life's Office of Government Affairs. As a member of the federal advocacy team, she communicates with key policymakers in Congress regarding New York Life's positions on privacy, legal, diversity and inclusion, and other public policy issues. She's also co-chair of New York Life's African American Employee Resource Group. Prior to this role, Whitney was an associate general counsel in New York Life's Office of the General Counsel. As a member of the litigation team, Whitney worked closely with business partners in assessing legal risk and exposure, developing legal strategy, and representing New York Life before both federal and state courts. Whitney also served as chair of the Diversity Committee for New York Life's legal and compliance departments. Prior to joining New York Life, Whitney was a litigation associate at Simpson Thatcher and Bartlett LLP, defending Fortune 100 corporations, private equity funds, and insurance companies in a wide variety of commercial disputes, including mergers and acquisitions, bankruptcy, Securities and False Claims Act litigation. She sat on the firm's Associates Committee and Diversity Advisory Council. Whitney received the firm's Pro Bono Recognition Award three times and received legal service Legal Services NYC's Pro Bono Recognition Award in 2011. She was named among the 2012 Empire State Council and received her Justice's Commitment to Justice Award in 2012. Whitney served as chair of the New York City Bar Association's Committee on Minorities in the Profession until her move to Washington, D.C. in 2019, having been a member of the committee since 2011. 
She was also co-chair of Legal Service NYC's Pro Bono Associate Advisory Board, having served as a member since 2015. She's a graduate of Yale University and Columbia Law School. Thank you both so much for joining us today. We are excited to learn more about successfully marketing to and serving clients across generations. All right, let's get started. So I'm delighted. Uh, I'm, this is Phyllis Weiss Hazaro. I'm delighted to bring this topic to you to emphasize the missing piece that most lawyers don't spend enough time incorporating when thinking about either business development or diversity and inclusion. It's the essential role that generational attributes and preferences and age diversity play in marketing and client service. So we will dive into that. Um, the overview of uh, most programs about generations at work focus on the internal issues and interactions. As a marketing and business development consultant for a few decades, I came to my intergenerational relations work with an external or client facing focus. So as advertised in the flyer, this webinar will give you valuable insights for your marketing and client relations, including interactions with your colleagues of all generations. Now, five generations, though predominantly in most firms and organizations, boomers, Gen Xers, and millennials. And we have a limited time for a lot of content. So I've prepared these slides to be text heavy rather than pretty pictures to serve as a long time reference tool, which you will be getting after the webinar. So I'm not going to touch on each bullet, um, but I welcome questions on anything not spoken about at the end or any time after the webinar. So let's start here. Before we get into specific attributes and behaviors for intergenerational rapport, I want to reference what I call essential skills and traits for success you can't learn, acquire, or practice by searching the internet. Briefly, super important for marketing and client service effectiveness are such things as curiosity, trust and empathy, high, high touch, personalization, the art of conversation, perspective of other people, which is really hard to know without talking to them, and transition fluidity, which is succession planning and knowledge transfer. And this is all really important for firm sustainability of client relations. You can't be a good business developer or networker without these things, especially curiosity, reciprocity, and, and so so forth. They these are only required acquired through conversations and relationships with people of difference that you work with reaching out, asking good questions, and listening. In my book, You Can't Google It, the compelling case for cross-generational conversation at work, they're explored through the lenses of five generations in the workplace. And these attributes are equally or more important than legal and technical knowledge as you progress in your career. Employers say that soft skills are king, regardless of what you have heard in school. I was at a um, conference yesterday put on by the Atlantic Magazine on the future of work, and over and over the, the employer panelists made that statement. Soft skills are king. That is what employers are looking for. So why care about all of this? This is basically a summary of the business case. So I've listed six reasons which you should be aware of at some level. The client experience focus, which is really very, very important now. 
as well as the employee experience focus, which we are hearing so much about and is, are things that firms are shifting their focus to. And it reflects the pre preferences of each generation. So we hear about these kinds of things and you know, social media disconnects is another one, which is a special frustration of in-house marketing professionals uh, and their fights of budgets with, with senior uh, management sometimes. And how to get your message across as, as persuasive. So there's some danger signs we want to be aware of that are generationally related uh, about the possible business loss. Human relations or humans tend to fear losses more than the absence of what they're trying to gain. So these are concerns we're hearing from clients. They want to see an age range of client team members. So when you're putting together a team, if especially if their business would, would be across the generations or their own team that you'd be working with is multi-generational. We've heard complaints about communication style between the generations and in fact, in 2004, when I decided to shift my main focus away from marketing business development that is not connected to generational things, uh, although we're still doing that as well, I, it, it was because managing partners were coming to me and saying, well, you know, I don't think that some of our younger people are understanding or communicating all that well with their older clients. And so I said, uh-huh, the, the, that recession from uh, 2001 is over. Time to really get into this. So there's also a lot of concern with the imminent retirement of boomer senior partners with the primary relationships that they, that they have. And what's going to happen if they leave or retire. And Generation X partners are also concerned about this and they feel very often that the, the transitioning process from the main relationship with the client is too slow in coming. I've coached some of them on how to try to get action on this transitioning. You do want, I mean, it's, it's vital for the sustainability of the business and not losing the clients. And another thing, um, this can be a danger sign, is when the lawyers that are working on particular matters are unfamiliar with new industries. Uh, Things are changing so fast. We have new industries and new occupations constantly. And younger people very often are more tuned in or have friends and peers who are in these new industries. So it's important to include them. Now I always throw this, this slide in just very briefly. I'm not going to talk about it much, but as a reference for people not clear on the approximate ages in which generation is which. And I, you know, I think birth years are not always the biggest determinant of people's generational preferences or what they um, connect with most, but it's a, a sort of a crutch or a cheat, cheat sheet uh, for us to use. So it's just some orientation and to look at the relative size of the different generations, which makes it clear that generation X is smaller in numbers 
and these are for the US population in general. And for Gen Z, we're not quite sure um, because they're still coming in. But it's estimated that Gen Z is the new larger population in the millennia. So I will have less about them, but my forthcoming book, Gen Engagement for the ABA, has several checklists with insights into Gen Z. So that's for the future. Okay, that's back to that seems to have gotten away from me. Okay, so we have intergenerational challenges as the sales issue. And I think this is really important because most people don't really think of that um, and incorporating it a lot with their business development. Many of these factors are overlooked, not realized, not given priority, but they do make a, a difference. And clients are usually more aware of them than the firms are, as has been true with other aspects of diversity and inclusion. Uh, you all are quite familiar with clients sometimes speaking up when they don't see any women or minorities in the pitch team or the people that are introduced as who's going to be working on their matters. So providers need to take them seriously, if not emphasize by senior management. And you need to be aware of the fact of intersectionality that age is the universal diversity factor. And if you're not uh, familiar with that bug, buzzword, what intersectionality is really referring to is that most people or many people these days and a lot of the younger ones particularly have more than one diversity factor that they identify with, whether it's gender, or um, race, ethnicity, LGBT, uh, and, and so on. So it's important to be aware when you're inter interacting with people, what they may be thinking, uh, how sensitive they, they might be, um, and feeling like you're recognizing them as a whole person. And be aware that differences in generational attitudes in form and influence attitudes and behaviors regarding all other aspects of diversity. So if you're sending the same messages in your communication to people of all generations, they are likely to be receiving them and interpreting them in different ways. That can cause problems. So if Whitney, let me bring you in here. You've held several leadership positions in DNI at New York Life and the New York City Bar. Uh, are there any comments you'd like to make about intersectionality's importance as a sales factor? Yes, absolutely. And it's something that I spend uh, a lot of time thinking about. Um, and my personal perspective has been that whether you're selling a widget or a service, or a message, my approach has always been to focus on the person in front of you and learn who they are in addition to uh, the role that they're playing in a given interaction with you. And as you said, Phyllis, people are not one dimensional. And for me personally, depending on the situation, the way I react could be more about being a millennial or a black person or a woman. Um, but in my opinion, what's important to recognize is that um, there are going to be certain things that you have in common um, and also acknowledge the things that make you different that can add to the richness of that dialogue. Okay, great. Um, just to sum up, as I said, I won't go through every point here in a, in a way I've covered them. So what is it at stake as, um, you know, as, as a sales um, issue or the market intelligence that you need to get, new niches, I you know, refer to those a little. Um, 
needing new additional skills that maybe some senior people didn't have because nobody taught them when they were learning. You want a combination of whatever people can bring. And having smooth leadership transitions that um, relate and establish rapport to the client side of things. So teams need to be both expert and age appropriate. Uh, let's see here. We, all right. So just a few, we talked about the intersectionality. So let's now look at what access each generation brings to business development. So you're putting a business development team together or you or have some influence in the composition of the team, you, you should want to make use of the assets of all of the team members, regardless of their seniority. It's not all about how senior or hierarchical in terms of having the most effective people working with you, either in the marketing aspect or the client service. So for boomers, for instance, you don't want to lose their relationships and soft skills, which tend to be uh, greater. This is a generalization, of course, I don't want to be offending anybody, but firms need to focus early enough on this gradual transitioning of client relationships. Clients want this but they, they really do appreciate the relationships and the, and the soft skills. Gen X has usually developed peer relationships with clients and referral sources and affiliated professionals by now and earned reputations outside the firm. And they are the peers very often of new and upcoming client leaders and decision makers. So you definitely want to give them an important role and say. And they can also bridge the communication styles of boomers and millennials. Often um, the Gen Xers, again, I don't want to offend anyone, but often have not taken enough initiative in taking the reins, so working hard, um, but, you know, trying to meet the clients where they, they are and pushing the firm to transition those relationships. Because boomers don't want to let go. So the Gen Xers need to seek leadership support for this and role shifts. All right, the younger generations is only one of them that we need to pay attention a lot now, which are the millennials who are still puzzling a lot of people, but they bring a lot to the table. They may have a good sense of coming marketplace needs and and peers uh, on the prospective client side. And they understand the value of networking and were educated to be team players. So that's definitely an asset. And they are also more cross-culturally aware and welcoming of the assets of diversity because it is, uh, in general, a more diverse generation than the Xers and particularly the boomers. The Gen Z, uh, again, they are entering in a few years, except that you may have people who are marketing professionals in the, in the firm who are Gen Z now, uh, you know, 22 or 23 years older or older, and also the knowledge management staff, which works on marketing. So just, you know, be aware of some of these attributes that you're going to be seeing from Gen Z, that they are tech savvy, that they are serious, um, 
they they really do want to learn from older generations, reach out to them. They like to meet in person, even though they're on their screens all the time. And they are eager for a lot of feedback and they knew, know that they need to improve their interpersonal skills. So if you're marketing to or for, and this is some of the things that are uh, tips for the younger generation, some things to bear in mind, especially for participation in outside organizations like bar associations and for training. Um, my experience uh, with consulting with uh, accounting firms and associations as well really pointed out uh, that, for instance, the Accountants Forum, which was always traditionally a very prestigious organization and they thought everybody wanted to be involved and it was uh, really uh, praiseworthy if people were asked to be members. Uh, they, they found themselves in a situation where most of the members were older and they still thought it was prestigious, but they weren't attracting the next generation in their 40s because they, those people didn't see the value. And in my interviews and market research, I found what they really wanted was not these speaker lunches and breakfast and PowerPoint presentations with little interaction and doing things, but they wanted management and leadership training and coaching and opportunities to initiate new ideas and activities as well as family focused activities because a lot of them are very focused on their kids and they don't want to spend the time away from them on weekends or nights unless they feel that there's a real value. And of course, networking is, is one of those values. So that's, and I've found this in, in legal associations as well as alumni associations from different schools. So keep in mind that they were less interested in formal member organizations, the people who are, uh, let's say, 40s and younger. Um, they want to participate in, or, in organizations to share outside interest. So that's where the relationships tend to be formed. There's less interest in formal CLE and things that make them feel like they're belonging. So show curiosity and uh, make sure you have some patience with developing these relationships. Now the next four slides deal with things that I've observed in my interactions and forums and coaching that are valuable to keep in mind for building rapport and working cooperatively between people of this specified pairs of generations. So for millennials who want to develop better rapport with boomers, uh, some things that you want to know, they want the millennials or anybody to be showing initiative, not just expecting to be spoon fed anything. Um, to not show any arrogance, um, you know, maybe a lot of millennials were told how brilliant they were in school, uh, and not to say that they aren't, um, but not to, uh, you know, try to show that, though, show your confidence. Ask how you can best serve clients, because boomers are really concerned with that, and they want to know that's top of mind uh, for you. Boomers like to have their achievements recognized and show interest as a millennial, inter 
in learning from them. So reverse and mutual mentoring is a good thing to do. And share your interest so people feel they're bringing their whole selves to work and that people really value them for the person that they are. So Whitney, as a millennial yourself, do these kinds of things ring true to you? What would you add, subtract, any experience of yours you'd like to share? Sure, and I guess the way I'll answer that question is by sharing a little bit of my own background. Um, so I'm an only child, and my parents are just a little bit older than um, most parents of people my age. I'm 34. Um, and on top of that, I spent a lot of time around my grandparents growing up. So if my mom was on the line today, she would tell you about how I grew up assuming that I automatically had a say, just like all the other adults in the room instead of the child that I actually was. Um, and the lesson in that is that, you know, like anyone who has spent most of their lives refining a skill, um, boomers included, it's important to recognize that journey. Um, and sort of work your way into the conversation. And I think that uh, in some cases, millennials have a reputation for sort of showing up and just flipping the whole table over and nobody likes that type of disruption. It can cause a lot of anxiety and angst. Um, but I'm in most cases in favor of sitting at the table and gradually making adjustments where it seems like it would be necessary. Um, so I think, Phyllis, what you've said here is spot on. Um, and I think especially recognizing um, that millennials will come along with, um, they want to see a certain amount of alignment between their company's mission and their personal compass um, and showing how that can be an asset to um, the, the team, I think is important. Um, for me personally, I always, look for ways that, in addition to the skill set that I have, how my personality um, can be of value to the team. And I'm, I'm not sure that um, in the boomer generation you see as much of a focus on thinking about things as nuances, you know, how does my personality fit into this? And it's more about the skill set and the experience, but you get sort of that added layer with millennials. And I think that can actually be leveraged in a way that, that's useful. Yeah, I think that's so important and, and very true. It's a difference in what, you know, the, the times people were educated and what was emphasized there. I think that's right. I yeah. think that's right. Yeah. Okay, so now let's flip that over. And so if boomers want to establish rapport with millennials, you touched on that a little bit. Um, here's some things that are very important. You want to keep them in the loop. I mean, I've found all the time millennials, um, especially about anything that affects them, they want to ha have some voice. It's not like they expect to get everything that they're talking about. It's not necessarily a demand, but they want to know what's going on. And if it's something that they feel is really affecting them to at least get a hearing. Um, they like reverse and mutual mentoring, as I mentioned from the other side. They love, I've found, introductions to your networks. They love the value, they know the value of networks, and many of them are big networkers. But if you can introduce them to people that can help their career or help them develop business, uh, they'll love you for it. Um, they, you know, show interest in learning from them. They think that they have a lot to share. And that is true because they come from a different perspective and were influenced by different th uh, things uh, in their formative stages. And so they want that to be appreciated and that they can actually teach that it's not a w just a, a one-way kind of uh, relationship or mentoring. 
um, they like to have a lot of recognition. That's something that uh, a lot of millennials got um, in school and from their coaches and their and, uh, their mentors. So that's that's something they really like to have. Some people think it's too much, but just keep it in mind. Um, they want you to be participating in social networks, and it is not at all true that the boomers don't participate in social media. Uh, as, as soon as they realized quite a while ago um, that they could use LinkedIn, especially, and sometimes Twitter, for business, they were all over it, and the largest group of people setting up accounts and using them. Also, um, boomers need to keep in mind that though everybody has a desire for flexibility, millennials especially do. So now I'm asking you to, you know, flip up flip over the viewpoint and as a millennial yourself at the receiving end give us some thoughts on the factors on the slide or if there's something else you want to add uh, about what works for boomers establishing rapport with millennials well I guess for a start um, Phyllis your point about um, dispelling the myth that boomers are not involved um, in social networks is absolutely true because my dad is hell on wheels on Twitter and my mom is constantly spamming me with Facebook posts. So they're very much social networking uh, literate. So that's always a fun experience. Um, but I guess just to take a step back. Um, so I joined New York Life at a time when the company's leaders were making um, a concerted effort to build a pipeline of future leaders so that all of the institutional knowledge um, doesn't leave when the current leaders retire. Um, and so one of the things that was very helpful there is having a concrete structured knowledge transfer program. Um, and so that's something that you've touched on in previous slides also, Phyllis, that I think is, is crucial. Um, but so other pieces that you've mentioned here, so I certainly fit into some of the stereotypes about millennials. Um, perhaps more than most, I love having a sense of belonging on my team. Um, I'm definitely like the cheerleader. Even when I was back in legal in New York, I was the one who would um, be approached whenever there needs to be some sort of a social event or people's birthdays and all kinds of fun things like that um, was really something I got a lot of, of pleasure out of. Um, feeding off of interaction as opposed to just being at my desk and staring at a screen all day. Um, my last boss was a boomer, and I'm pretty sure I pushed the line towards annoying him with how much I would run to his office anytime you know there was a positive development in one of my cases or something had gone particularly well. Um, my current boss is a Gen Xer and tolerates me slightly more, <laughs> but I still try to be mindful about that. Um, and I think, um, again, what I mentioned before about just being mindful that we have a lot to offer, and it might be and a slightly different package than what you're used to, um, but is useful all the same. Um, keeping us in the loop, I think, is very important. Um, and the way you described it, it's perfect, Phyllis, that we don't need to be driving the bus all the time, but just feeling like we know the direction that it's headed is important. Um, you know, loved my firm, but didn't always get the impression that I knew what the big picture was. Sometimes it felt a little micro and you'll just get a better work product, I think, out of people if they have a better sense of, of what you're really getting at. One-on-one um, -on -one conversations, I would say, um, emphasize that it's just that. It's, it's a conversation. It's a team leading toward a consensus and not so much a directive. Um, I think when it's more of the latter, you tend to um, create situations where you might be creating pupil syndrome um, among some of your younger employees who are looking to contribute, but if it's always a, you know, do this because I need this, then you're not really explaining the why as opposed to the what um, yeah. I think is necessary. Um, and I think also just recognizing, especially considering that I think there are statistics that show that people in my generation and younger are 
changing jobs more frequently than older generations. Like, you know, I remember at my firm, partners that I worked for had literally started at the firm after law school and retired there and had never had any job but that in between. And you see people more often these days in the younger generations will maybe change jobs every five years or so until they find something that really speaks to them. So with that in mind, recognizing that Credibility can be a byproduct of time spent at a particular place, but it's not the only way that you can build credibility. Um, and from my end of things, um, it's helpful to feel like I don't just need to tick off the days on the calendar before what I say can carry as much weight as other folks. But just if I can demonstrate to you that I do have an expertise in a particular area um, and I have researched this and I've had, uh, you know, thought it through that I can be just as credible as the next person, despite, um, you know, my age. So I'll leave it there. But um, I think this slide here really sums it up. Yeah. And, and you too. I mean, at the age 34, you've accomplished an awful lot, as we heard in your um, bio. Thanks. Uh, so uh, it must be working, and and you know I I think that some of the things that you mentioned were very important to add. Okay, um, and one well one thing is it's interesting you were getting of uh, you know finding it more comfortable with having a Gen X bo boss because. Um, um, here's a, a slide about rapport with Gen X, and I've observed, and again, this is a generalization, and I, I'm not the only one, that the boomers and the millennials often have better rapport between their two generations and either with either of those generations with members of Generation X. So here are some things I recommend to keep in mind when interacting with Gen X. They are um, independent minded and like to make their own decisions. And financial advisors find that all the time. Don't tell them what to do. Don't tell them what to invest in. Don't ask for help for things you can do yourself. You know, they, again, they want to see initiative. Um, they like to see that you um, have specific goals and that there are options, that there's not just one way. Um, yeah, don't, don't expect spoon feeding from Gen Xers for the most part. And don't micromanage them. They, uh, you need to ask for and give effective feedback to them and don't expect automatic loyalty. I mean, you were saying, uh, you were, you're just saying about the millennials changing jobs more frequently, but everyone is, you know, and especially as we see that a lot of firms think they're marketing plan is to bring in laterals, which has not brought the success they would like about that particular strategy. But people have been moving a lot. Before the 1980s, nobody ever moved at all, even the associates. Uh, but that has, that has really changed and, and, and sped up. Okay, and so let's see here. Uh, I have a slide here about rapport with Gen Z, but as I said, uh, that's not anything to really focus on now, just to think about for the future. And this is a reference tool, so you can have that. Okay. Um, is there anything else you would like to add, Whitney, about uh, about Gen Z, uh, X? Sorry, who are usually the parents of Gen Z? <laughs> I think maybe just in the interest of time, I'll table the few comments I had about X and Z, and maybe we can talk about networking tips for folks listening in. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we won't talk about about Z. So. Um, 
let's see, networking. These tips really work for any generation and are things to keep in mind if you're nervous about cross-generational interaction. So, you know, I mentioned before introducing your young colleagues to people you know. So if you're at an event, um, not only make an introduction, but give some context for a conversation so that it's not awkward. Reach out. You know, don't don't wait for somebody else to reach out to you. We're seeing so much with all the divisive there is divisiveness there is in the world now that people are always waiting for somebody else to reach out to them. But they, you know, people would appreciate it if you if you do. Um, look for things that you can learn. Um, ask people to teach whether they're older or younger and be accepting of that and make sure that you promptly follow up with information and actions that have been promised. Um, Whitney, especially in your new role, what do you find is effective in networking with, for instance, you, you interact with older government personnel now that you need to persuade and with the younger Washington staffers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I suppose if I had to sum it up, my job right now, I was in legal, now I'm a lobbyist, and it's to monitor legislation that's introduced in Congress for bills that relate to my industry, discuss them with my colleagues back in our home office, and then share our position on them to those members of Congress who would like to hear our perspective. Um, and so naturally a great deal of what I have to do involves relationship building with both members of Congress and their staff because it's important to know or important for them to know rather that I'm reliable and trustworthy um, and a, a credible source of information. And so what Phyllis is alluding to is that there's an interesting dynamic because in many cases the members themselves are uh, baby boomers are older in some cases, and their staff can be younger than me sometimes. So for all the things that Phyllis mentioned before um, are kind of, they play into my day-to-day -day role. Um, and not that you're constantly thinking about all of these bullets, but what's important is just to spend time learning what your client values in a working relationship and just sort of knowing them as a three-dimensional person informed by the things that influenced them as they were growing up in their generation, in their peer group, um, and a number of different factors, and sort of approaching them that way. So it's kind of a complicated dance, but um, you know, not one that can't be mastered. Great, great. And I'm sure you will continue to do very well in it. Um, so let's look at some action steps here. Now, I think the, the slides, the previous slides are full of action steps too. I want you to have takeaways for things that you can start doing if you're not doing them already with, uh, you know, a good grounding on, on the generational preferences. But, for you, um, you know, we know there's been lots of talk and about diversity and personal biases. Try to identify what yours are and understand what influenced them in order to be able to eliminate them as much as possible. Find commonalities that you have with people that takes some conversations. I am very big on conversations, cross-generational conversations, uh, and, and look for those things because that's what's really going to bond and, and cause, um, cause trust and empathy. Um, be authentic. Do share your own experiences, not just about the work that you're assigned to do or hired to do. And I would like to see you all educating others about the benefits of cross-generational conversation and collaboration. And for your firm, there are things that employers need to do. You can, as individuals, do all of these things on your own. 
But think about how you can encourage these kinds of efforts toward furthering generational harmony and prevent disconnects and tensions. Um, you know, from a, what I've seen and you know, what I, I keep asking in different firms and companies, there are all these <clears throat> affinity groups and or, or uh, employee resource groups, very few have ones that are based around generations or age diversity. Uh, it's most of the time about gender, about LGBTQ, uh, about race and ethnicity, a little more now on diver uh, disability as well. But as I said earlier, age is the universal diversity and it really influences and uh, informs all the other aspects. So give this some more serious thought and try to establish programs to foster generationally collaborative culture, get leaders to do that and to support it. Um, anything you want to add to these action steps and then I will just wrap up with a couple of things as famous last words. Um, I would just say the thing that I try to keep in the back of my mind is that no matter who you're talking to, but in particular with, um, you know, baby boomers and bridging that gap, they've all been your age. And if we're lucky, we'll be theirs one day and just keep empathy in mind. Great. So uh, we're coming to the end. We're going to leave some time for some questions. We hope you'll have questions. But these tips will pro prove valuable if you follow them. Um, I encourage you to reach out to me if I can help with any more details. And I suggest that you try to avoid divisiveness among the generations, eliminate ageism biases, whether it's for, toward older or younger colleagues or clients. So I'm, you know, encouraging what I, I call the new word I made up, collaborageism. And to adopt hierarchical flexibility. And, and what I mean by that is, it's not necessarily how many years of experience you have for certain things, but to bring everybody to the table that you can, listen to their ideas, and use what's appropriate and best for each situation um, to avoid as much as possible a chaos system that law firms are pretty famous for. It's a multi-generational world, whether that's comfortable all the time or not. So adapt the habit of being cross-generational. It will make your work and life more fulfilling and fun. And uh, I guess these last two slides have some contact information, ways to keep in touch. If you have any more questions, and there may even be a few in the box now that we don't have time to right now. Uh, I love getting questions and want to help you as much as possible. I want to see you all be absolutely as successful as you can be. Thanks so much, Phyllis. Right, Phyllis's information is there. Here's Whitney's information. And um, we sincerely appreciate your interest in our webinar series. So stay on the webinar to give us your feedback. And please feel free to reach out to me or to Jeannie Lee. Um, our contact information is on the next slide if you have any questions or suggestions for future webinars. And please join us on March 18th and June 17th for our next two webinars. The March uh, webinar will feature women in technology. And um, we haven't set the topic yet for June, but we will keep everyone informed. 
And we wish you all very successful rainmaking for the end of 2019 and for 2020. And we hope to see you on March 18th for the next webinar. Thank you. And here's to your successful rainmaking. And best holiday wishes to everybody. Um, that's all the time that we have for today. I'd like to thank our Women Rainmakers Committee and all of you for attending our webinar today. I'd also like to thank Carol, Whitney, and Phyllis for presenting. We will now conclude the webinar.